uh, welcome everybody to this uh, career panel on, on, on the science diplomacy. I would like to thank the, the speakers uh, who agreed to, um, to share their uh, career path and their experience uh, in science diplomacy. And also uh, Alessandro uh, Allegra, who is our uh, modera moderator today and who is a science and innovation policy consultant. Um, I would like to uh, remind everyone to avoid uh, background noise that only speakers should have uh, their video and microphone on. So everyone in the audience, uh, please keep your microphone and video off. Um, so I'm uh, Laurie Hervieu and I'm a postdoctoral fellow uh, in New York City uh, and a board member uh, at uh, INET NYC, which is an, the association who organized this event. Um, so while I'm presenting a little bit uh, more uh, INET, I would like to uh, the, under, the, the audience to answer a poll uh, so that we, we know a little bit more who is with us today. And I will share the, the results um, at the end of the, um, of the INET presentation. Um, so, um, INET NYC stands for uh, International Networking. Uh, and it's based uh, in New York City, and in it has been uh, founded in uh, 2014. Um, sorry, our mission is to support and offer professional development opportunities for uh, international scientists uh, in training in STEM um, in the New York City uh, area and help community building um, to fa facilitate connections between international scientists. And to do that, we organize um, career panels, um, networking with professionals, uh, and some uh, social events as well. Um, our board members um, are um, scientists from um, all of the research institutions uh, uh, in New York City, and we have uh, more than uh, 900 uh, foreign scientists that are uh, members of INET, and most of them are uh, graduate, uh, international graduate um, students or uh, postdoctoral fellows. Um, we are, um, we uh, invite you to join us on uh, our social medias uh, and to become, to be part of our uh, large network. So we have LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and uh, Instagram. And you can also visit our uh, website uh, to, to register to our uh, newsletter. Uh, the next event uh, of that Arnec INET is organizing um, is, will be on uh, Thursday, June 18th. Uh, on, uh, it will be an immigration uh, webinar. Uh, where we will discuss green card and uh, visa opportunities for scientists in the US. And we also have monthly, monthly um, after work hangouts uh, every first uh, Thursday of the month. So usually we meet in the bars, but now we are doing like video uh, hangouts. So I would like to thank uh, I INET uh, board members, the, our uh, advisory board and uh, the co-founders uh, of INET who allow us to uh, organize these great uh, events. And uh, again, <clears throat> to become a member, you can visit our website or also apply for uh, open position to be part of our uh, board. And if you need more information, you can also con contact us following the, the email address that is uh, that appears in the screen. Um, so as I was, uh, okay, so as I was uh, saying at the beginning, the event is, the event is recorded. Uh, so please, for the audience, uh, keep your um, microphone off. Uh, and I will uh, virtually uh, pass the mic to Alessandro and ask him to present himself and um, talk a little bit about science diplomacy and he will be the one um, asking the questions to the, to, the, to the speakers. And thank you again for uh, joining us. 
Great. Well, thank you, Laurie, for uh, putting this together, for uh, inviting us and giving us the opportunity to discuss uh, science diplomacy and science diplomacy careers. Uh, it's, it's great. It's great to do so with uh, such a panel, which represents a very broad range of experiences, but also with such a great wide audience. Uh, I mean, we have a, a huge interest in this. And uh, hopefully, uh, from this survey that you're filling, we'll get also an idea of where you're joining from, what uh, sort of like is your interest in science diplomacy. Um, so we can sort of like get going, get talking. So first, I'll say a couple of words about like myself and what is science diplomacy to me. So uh, I'm Alessandro Allegra. I'm based at University College London. Uh, I'm a researcher working on scientific advice and science policy. Uh, I should I'm not a scientist myself in the natural science sense, but rather I'm a philosopher by training, now working as a social scientist, having worked in science policy professionally. So I'm sort of like hybrid creature, and I feel that a lot of us in science policy, science diplomacy, are in one way or another like hybrid creatures. So uh, hopefully uh, we're going to hear uh, uh, the many shapes and forms that such hybrid can take. Um, but yeah, I mean, my experience uh, goes from sort of like UK level. I've worked in the Royal Society in London, the UK National Academy of Sciences. Uh, I worked at UNESCO, the UN Agency for Science and Culture. I had some experiences with the OECD, uh, the European Union, and my own research is on how science is used in policy making in the European Union. So it's kind of like that mix. And I'm also involved with various networks uh, around science policy, science advice, science diplomacy, including the International Network for Government Science Advice, the INSA network. Uh, so when it comes to like science uh, diplomacy, uh, it's a term that has many different meanings and means different things to different people. Uh, it's, a, it's a scholarly field. There's people that do research on science diplomacy. Uh, it's something that people do without even realizing it's science diplomacy, but others refer to what they're doing as science diplomacy. And there's also lots of people who say they're doing science diplomacy while actually are just talking about science diplomacy. Uh, and I think it would be interesting to like tease out a little bit some of these differences. But I think it's important to keep in mind that science diplomacy is a very broad umbrella term uh, that can actually mean a lot of different things. It can be a set of practices or things you do. Uh, it can be an aspirational narrative. It can also be a political tool to an extent. Uh, so it's interesting to keep in mind all these tensions when thinking about science diplomacy. Also, there is sometimes a bit of confusion between uh, science diplomacy, science policy, science advice. Some of these terms are used interchangeably. There's clearly a lot of overlaps. Uh, I mean, usually we think of science advice as scientists providing advice to policymakers, which can be at a domestic level, can be at an international level, which of course has a diplomatic dimension. But sometimes also science is used almost metaphorically as if science and policy are two countries and then science diplomats are somehow mediating between these different uh, countries, while other times has a very strict meaning in terms of talking about specific agreements which have a, a scientific component. Uh, so in a way, we're not going to resolve uh, any of these ambiguities and intentions today, but I think it's important to keep them in mind uh, because when we think about what a career in science diplomacy looks like, well, uh, it, it can mean different things depending what your idea uh, of science diplomacy is. Uh, anyway, I uh, won't give into, uh, I won't go into like my own lecture about what I think science diplomacy is or should be. Uh, some of you have heard it many times and we had some long arguments with some of the people on the panel uh, about this, uh, but I, I'll give the word to them. And I should say like many of the people uh, on the panel are, are friends and colleagues, people I've known now for many years. Uh, other uh, I've not met yet, I'm having the pleasure to meet now, uh, but um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great community of people coming from quite different um, life paths, uh, and uh, those paths keep crossing somehow. Um, and yeah, as I said, uh, each of the panelists has a very diverse range of experiences. Uh, it's also hard to pin them down under a job title. Uh, I mean, I will try to say, like one or two words about each of them, but I will let them introduce themselves because I think I will be completely lost trying to summarize um, all they're doing. Um, before I start, Laurie, can I please ask you to go back to the slide, the cover slide, so that we have the names and pictures of all the panelists there so that our audience can share. Sure. Um, um, I just want to remind also the audience that they can ask questions in the chat uh, and that we will uh, ask the, these questions at the end of the, of the discussion that I, I forgot to say at the beginning. 
Yes, so the format will be the next like about 50 minutes. Uh, it will be a discussion uh, uh, among the, the panelists, uh, and then there will be time for questions from the audience. Uh, depending how many questions we get, uh, we might need to manage a little bit. Uh, maybe uh, we'll uh, sort of like uh, how can I say? consolidate some of the questions, but let, let's see how this goes. But uh, more or less, we'll start with this um, with a panel discussion. So. Uh, on the panel, uh, we have uh, Dr. Alicia Perez Porro, who is a marine biologist, uh, is the president of the Association of Spanish Researchers in the US, uh, and is a, a sustainability consultant. Uh, then we have Dr. Melania Guerra, who is an engineer by training, uh, now an oceanographer uh, and a science diplomacy strategist. Uh, now, please forgive me if I'm like getting this wrong, but that's uh, the idea I made uh, myself of, of, of you from your profiles. I know that each of you has a much richer experience in this, so I'm trying to capture it in, in a couple of words. Um, then we have uh, Dr. Jean-Christophe Madoui, uh, also known as JC, uh, who's an astrophysicist by training, uh, and now a science diplomacy lecturer at UCL Department for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Public Policy, Steve. So is actually, JC is a colleague at UCL. Um, we also sometimes even cross paths in the office when, you know, back in the days when people would actually go to the office before all of this happened. Uh, then uh, we have uh, Dr. Lorenzo Melcher, who's a molecular biologist by training, uh, and now a science advice and science diplomacy officer at the Spanish Foundation for Science and Technology. Uh, we have Dr. Margaret Waltzler, uh, who's a, a science diplomacy champion and World Economic Forum Young Global Leader, uh, working on science diplomacy. And last but not least, uh, we have Dr. Jessica Tome Garcia, who's a, a biomedical scientist by training uh, and an analyst at the Sustainable Development Solutions Networks. So quite a range of disciplines. Um, from astrophysics, well, there's quite a few biologists, molecular biologists, and that sort of thing, but you know, quite a range. And there will be the token social scientist, I guess, for uh, diversity. Um, so I will say, let's start, uh, and uh, maybe Alicia, uh, you can start, uh, and you can tell us a little bit, uh, well, where are you based now? Where are you sort of like connecting from? Uh, but most importantly, what is science diplomacy to you? And how did you end up getting into science diplomacy? Hi, hello everyone. Thank you, Alessandro, and thank you, Lori, for this introduction and inviting me and us to this to this panel. So I am from Spain, from Barcelona. I've been living in the US for um, 11 years now. I am usually based in New York City, but in the whole pandemic, Started, we moved the whole family to New Hampshire, where I am right now. Um, I have two little kids, eight months and three and a half years old, and um, staying at home with two little kids uh, without daycare and without help was driving us nuts. So we decided to to come to this house that my husband's family has, and and that's why I'm not right now based in New York, but usually I'm. So um, answering your question about what, what science diplomacy is uh, to me, um, science diplomacy to me is, is the umbrella under which academics and, and governments, international institutions, private companies, the civil society can connect using science as, as the common language. And when I realized about that, for me it was a big aha moment. Um, as all my fellow panelists today, I started my career as a researcher, but I was feeling trapped in, in academia. And at some point I was not understanding the purpose of my research or of just doing research. So right after my PhD, I joined ECUSA, the Association for Spanish Scientists in, in the US and became very active inside the, the organization. I founded the Commission for Women in Science inside ECUSA and was part of the executive committee. And I guess that that's, that's how I started my career in science diplomacy. Basically, without knowing that I was starting a career in science diplomacy <laughs> and just following my interests, 
my my gut and using my skills in places where I was feeling naturally more comfortable. And then I went to Antarctica with other 80 women uh, with a background in STEM, with a program, Homeboy Bound, that Marga and Melania are also part of. And it was in Antarctica where actually I had this aha moment that I mentioned at the, at the beginning. And my, my second aha moment was at a AAAS Science Diplomacy Workshop run by Madaga, where Mande Holford, who is one of my professional crushes, please everyone Google <laughs> her, um, gave us an amazing talk about all the science diplomacy aspects that her research on marine snails has, and said that all researchers are doing science diplomacy on a daily basis without even knowing it. And for me, that was my second aha moment, because until then, I thought about science diplomacy as a new career, kind of disconnected from my previous one as a researcher, and that I needed to learn absolutely everything from scratch. And Marga and, and Mandy basically taught me that it was wrong. And so, and, and my last aha moment, and I swear that this is the last one that I'm going to mention in this panel, um, was at the same workshop where Melania uh, gave us a talk and said something that it was like music to my, to my ears, ocean diplomacy. And, and then everything made sense to me. And I am purposely mentioning this, this last aha moment because I wanna say to, I mean, most of the audience are grad students and postdocs. So I wanna say that I am not there yet. I am transitioning towards climate and ocean diplomacy, but I am not there yet. And I am mentioning this because you might read our CVs and you might read our profiles and you might think, oh my God, this person made it, is amazing. I'm not saying that we are not amazing, but what I'm saying is that um, a career in, in science diplomacy for me is, is very fluid. It's a fluid path. And I am doing, I, I, I have a career in science diplomacy but I am still learning a lot of things and I'm still having a lot of dreams that I am pursuing inside the science diplomacy sphere. Thanks, Alicia. So it sounds like it's a, it's, it's a, it's a career in the making and it's a constant making and epiphanies seem to be uh, a common thread in that. Uh, Melania, do you want to share your experience about what science diplomacy is to you? Hi, yes, thank you so much, Alessandro and uh, Alicia for getting us started on such a strong personal um, vibe. Uh, I am very happy to be here with many that I consider friends and hopefully more that I will consider friends too. Uh, I am talking to you now from Costa Rica where I am originally from. Uh, so um, although I have uh, lived in the US for about a third of my life, I went to grad school in the United States and I also did two postdocs as a scientist uh, in the US. Uh, and it was actually during my second postdoc in 2015 uh, as an oceanographer that does Arctic work uh, that I had what I call my Eureka moment. So similar to what Alicia is describing, uh, I was literally working in the Bering Strait. So I was on a ship in the middle of two islands. So I think few people uh, imagine that the Bering Strait is really very narrow. It's only... Uh, two and a half miles between one island that belongs to the US and one island that belongs to Russia. So I was sitting in the middle, I was co uh, you know, collaborating on a ship with Russian scientists. I had also worked at NASA before, so I had seen uh, what it took for Russia and the US to build a space station. And it had this amazing, uh, I had this amazing awareness about the international component of science. I had already been very involved in policy, science policy, because I was already uh, advising some of the local communities in the Arctic about how to deal with the oil exploration aspect up there. Uh, so I was not, you know, it was not that I, I didn't know that science influenced policy, but that new awareness about the international component was what completely froze me in place. And it was the same year that the um, Agenda 2030 of the Sustainable Development Goals was being negotiated, and also, of course, the Paris Agreement. So I started looking for mentors, and thankfully, I didn't have to look very far. Uh, Costa Rica at the time had two amazing examples of science diplomats. 
One was the ambassador of Costa Rica to the US. Uh, his name is Roman Macaya. He is a bioscientist and he was the ambassador in DC. And the other person was Cristiana Figueres, who was a Costa Rican leading the process of the uh, Paris Agreement. So I contacted them both and I expressed my interest in science diplomacy uh, and they pointed me to Marga, to the trainings at AAAS as well. So I attended those and the one in Trieste. And I started training those skills to be prepared to leave academia in 2016. By the time I left academia, I was so afraid. I felt like I was looking at a cliff and you know, didn't know what I was jumping into or whether the field even existed in a solid way that it would hold me. And I found an amazing fellowship at the UN uh, with the Nippon Foundation, where I was trained for almost a year on ocean diplomacy and law of the sea, international law, all of these aspects of the ocean that as an oceanographer, I had never been taught. Um, and thanks to all of that training, I started working also as a negotiator for Costa Rica. Uh, the government gave me the opportunity to serve as a, as a negotiator for the climate COP. So I have been attending the, the climate negotiations with the delegation for three years. And it has been really, um, it really amazing to serve on the other side. So not as a scientist diagnosing the problem, but trying to understand how to integrate oceans and climate and then diplomacy into the solutions. Uh, it definitely is um, also work in progress like Alicia describes, and I am in the process of getting more trained. So I have been accepted to Princeton and I am starting in about a month uh, with a master's in public policy there. Uh, so it is also something that I am inventing as I go and I am making it up and learning from the other people that are here to open up more opportunities for other people. Thanks, Melania. Well, I guess like it, it, two things I picked up from what you said. One is the importance of finding uh, mentors or role models, which uh, I think it's also something that Alicia mentioned. Uh, and the other one is this idea that uh, you always have so much to learn. You might be a great expert in a certain subject area, which you probably are after a PhD or even some postdocs, but there is so much more out there. And one thing I've seen a lot in science policy and science diplomacy is that in order to get started, sometimes you have to take up roles that at first might seem sort of like going a step or two steps back. Like, you know, I already have a PhD. Why would I do a master's? Why would I do an internship? But actually, you are sort of like stepping into a professional world, which is very different from the world one you trained in. Uh, and I've seen it a lot, uh, sort of like in career people, uh, you know, having the courage in a way uh, of accepting that actually they don't know about something. And it's okay to be an intern in your like, you know, late 20s or early 30s, uh, even if you're like a postdoc, uh, you know, under your belt, because you still learn a lot. And this is going to pay off probably like in the, in the medium to long run, all those experiences really pay off. Great. Well, um, so let's move on to JC. Yeah, hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's good to see you, Alessandro. It's good to see you all. Uh, it's good to be with friends and colleagues. Um, so good to see you. Uh, thanks for the invitation, uh, Ainet and YC and, and Laurie for reaching out. Um, so I'm, I'm um, talking to you from France at the moment. So I'm from France originally, as my name seems to indicate, but everybody calls me JC, so uh, I'm happy with that. But uh, yeah, connecting from France, I'm in Northern Brittany to be exact. I'm at my parents' house in lockdown um, after things are, I went crazy. Uh, I am. I just got caught up in the lockdown here. Um, but I'm, as Alessandro said, uh, usually based in in London at uh, University College London, and I'm a colleague of Alessandro and working at a science policy department there, focusing on science diplomacy issues. Um, I, I I I don't think I've had like a eureka moment as Alicia described. I think there were many, you know, few small eureka moments for me, but no like real defining ones. Uh, it was kind of a slower transition. And as you said, at Assemble, it was also a lot of taking uh, that path. Um, so in, 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 in a nutshell, um, uh, I'm getting a lot of background noise. So maybe you can just make sure that you all mute your mic if you're not talking right now. So, sorry to interrupt, JC. No, 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 absolutely. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. It's good? Better now? I think so. All right. Yeah, so I was saying for me, it was a quite a slow transition um, and, and no real like 
you know, big Eureka moments and I, I did have to take steps back. Um, so before I get to that, I'll, um, I just want to say, you know, what, what science diplomacy means to me. Um, and it's, it's very difficult. It's a lot of things. But to me, it's a way to infuse uh, science in the process of international relations so that we can better address, uh, you know, global challenges uh, uh, that are increasingly SMT driven and uh, science, infuse science into the diplomatic process. Um, that said, it's, it's not, uh, a lot of voices are predominantly driving the field towards the sort of state-led uh, science diplomacy. Um, so, but to me, it's a very, a, a broad multi-actor uh, field. And, and we've heard already about this, and I'm sure we'll have a good discussion about what multi-actor means, but uh, there is a diversity of factors uh, there. So just to, um, yeah, to give you a, a bit of background. So yes, I, I'm a former uh, astrophysicist, former as a previous career, um, otherwise always an astronomer. And I did uh, two postdocs. So I was also uh, deep into the postdocs when I started pivoting slowly. And my first pivot was working for the International Astronomical Union, which is the body of uh, astronomers worldwide. I was based out of Cape Town in South Africa, looking at, um, pushing uh, and developing astronomy research and education uh, worldwide, globally. Uh, and that, went, that was my first small foray into science policy and science diplomacy as I was talking to various ministers, diplomats to advance scientific projects and scientific collaboration uh, and developing astronomy and science in the process. Um, so that was my first uh, pivot, but uh, actually, so, I, I wanted to know more about international relations. I wanted to work in science diplomacy, although I didn't know the field was named science diplomacy when I first wanted to get into it. Uh, but I, I actually didn't really succeed in getting um, a position directly in the field or an internship, say at the UN or UNESCO or the UN Outer Space Affairs Office, which was my dream at the time. So it was a lot of hurdles and I took a step back and I went and got a master's in international relations at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy and learned a whole lot about diplomacy and IR there. And that actually sent me to the path of combining really science and diplomacy. And that was then what uh, um, you know, got me in the contact of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the Center of Science Diplomacy where uh, Marga uh, worked for quite some time and we'll hear more about them, I'm sure. Um, and this is where I, I became a research scholar, try to push uh, science diplomacy research further, uh, looking at international scientific organizations, about at science attaché networks and all kinds of fields or subfields of science diplomacy. And we can talk about that again uh, later in the discussion. And eventually, so I took sort of the academic track into science diplomacy and now um, um, doing research and teaching at UCL as, as a lecturer in science diplomacy at the science policy department. So trying to push the field there. That's for me. Thanks, JC. Thanks a lot. Okay, well, then now let's hear from Lorenzo. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, congratulations, I met uh, New York uh, because you have gathered such a, a great uh, panel uh, with uh, some experts, uh, even though that we are young and we have funny English accents. But uh, let me... Uh, so you're joining us from Mars, is that correct? No, um, uh, this is actually my living room. Uh, <laughs> but uh, if you want me to, uh, if you want to think that I live in Mars, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah. Uh, what is science diplomacy for me? So as uh, Alicia has mentioned, or Melania and JC, science diplomacy, it's the interactive space between science and international relations. Uh, and, and here there is space for uh, scientists, uh, scholars, for uh, academics, uh, diplomats, policy makers, policy managers, and plenty of other practitioners. I quite agree with uh, JC, science diplomacy must not be only understood as a nation state approach, but also as a multi-stakeholder endeavor, where even scientific associations uh, such as INET New York or uh, NGOs can make a huge uh, impact. 
Having said that, what's my story with science diplomacy? Uh, as Alessandro has mentioned, uh, my life, my former life was that of a PhD in molecular biology uh, with 13 years of academic experience. I used to be a cancer researcher uh, trying to find the cure for cancer, breast cancer, multiple myeloma, and plenty of uh, other diseases. But um, even though that was a very successful uh, postdoc, uh, I was doing my postdoc in London, I felt in the lab like if I were in the middle of the Plato's cave myth. Like I was staring at uh, the wall of a cave uh, without being totally aware of how vast the world is and how little impact science can make if there is no one out there who brings the voice of science. So uh, whilst I was doing my second postdoc in London, I, I've experienced a few different uh, moments or experiences that made me get out of the plateau's cave. The first one, was uh, the fact that I was the founding president of the Society of Spanish Researchers in the United Kingdom, SRUK. This is the first Spanish scientific association of sci scientists abroad. Uh, and uh, yeah, well, that was for me a very good experience uh, as to be able to get to know myself much better because it get me out of my comfort zone in, uh, from the lab and making, made me aware that I was very good at project management, at managing people, at doing institutional relationships, and engaging with uh, key uh, scientists in the field, but also with policymakers, with people from the embassies, and uh, people from other uh, big organizations like uh, the Royal Society or British Council. So that experience for me made me get to know myself much better and get me experiences that I couldn't be living in the lab. And I guess many of the audience here who belongs to the INET uh, New York uh, network is also experiencing this kind of experiences uh, through the network and not just by being in the lab. So that was the first experience. Which one was the second one? Second one was the fact that I was selected to be part of the Royal Society Parent Scheme in 2013. This is a parent scheme that allows scientists to spend a week in Westminster, uh, in the Houses of Parliament, and be the shadow of an MP. At that moment, I was exposed with how complex is the scientific advisory mechanisms in the UK, both to the executive power and to the legislative power and made me launch, uh, come on, I would like to take actions to implement some of these activities, some of these actions in Spain, to the Spanish government, to the Spanish parliament, to anything. Anyway, those were the two biggest experiences in that transition. And at the end of 2015, I, was, uh, I had to choose between either continuing my successful academic career, I had different job prospects in many countries, or uh, applying for jobs at different places to start working in science advice or science diplomacy. And I was lucky enough to get uh, hired by the Spanish Foundation for Science and Technology to work uh, in the Spanish Embassy in London as part of a pilot project uh, because Spain, Spain doesn't have scientists working in embassies. We have uh, diplomats or innovation delegates, but we lack scientists working in the embassies. So they launched this three-year pilot project to test it. And I was uh, selected in the process to work for three years from 2015 to 2018 at the Spanish embassy. In there, I got to experience science diplomacy uh, on a daily basis. And I was engaging Spain and the UK through different scientific activities. Obviously, it also allowed me to understand that even though that I was very knowledgeable in molecular biology and cancer and science in general, I lack a lot of expertise in international relationships and public policy. So after I finished my stay at the embassy, I decided to take a master in policy analysis and I'm halfway through already. 
Also, I got uh, involved in a citizen initiative called Ciencia en el Parlamento to raise awareness of legislative science advice in the Spanish Parliament. And third, I got back to Spain, to Madrid, to keep working at the Spanish Foundation for Science and Technology on an European project called S4D4C, using science for in diplomacy for addressing global challenges. This is an European consortium that is advising the European Union as to how better promote science diplomacy in the European Union, but also the, uh, in the member states. And uh, we uh, approach it uh, as a multi-stakeholder endeavor. We produce lots of research outputs, but also policy outputs. In fact, like uh, two weeks ago, we published a policy paper that is calling for a systemic change in science diplomacy at the European Union level. So the EU is able to lead the, uh, the fight against global challenges. And uh, in these days with COVID-19, uh, the policy report is, uh, is mandatory to be read. And I encourage you to do it because it's also a participatory process. We will be receiving comments from the audience to implement them in a uh, second version of the policy paper at the end of the year. Thank Lastly, you, uh, that's more or less everything for now. Great. Well, thanks a lot, Lorenzo. And I should add that, in a way, Lorenzo has been my role model in, in, in some ways, in the sense that uh, what he mentioned about the Citizens' Initiative in Spain, the Ciencia del Parlamento, uh, has inspired me and some other colleagues, uh, I'm from Italy myself, to launch something similar in Italy. So last year we launched uh, Scienza in Parlamento, a bottom-up campaign, to advocate for science advice in Italian Parliament, very much inspired uh, and advised by our Spanish friends and colleagues. Uh, also, as uh, Lorenzo uh, was involved with the Association of Spanish Researchers in the UK, uh, and Alicia is involved in the same association in the US, I'm involved in the Association of Italian Scientists in the UK, uh, and uh, these associations that exist in various countries or various nationalities offer a great platform to both meet like-minded people uh, develop the skills uh, and practice the skills that are useful in science diplomacy uh, and also give you a platform for uh, professional development. So I encourage uh, any of you who has the opportunity uh, to get involved with um, this sort of networks or create one if one is not there uh, because they have great value uh, both in terms of networking skills and they can really drive change uh, uh, back, back home, for example. A lot of these initiatives are driven by uh, scientific diasporas in a way, and I mean, we could have a whole other uh, panel about that. But uh, I'll now pass uh, the mic uh, to Marga, who has very kindly been answering uh, on the chat uh, about some of the questions about specific training opportunities that exist. Uh, and of course, things are a little bit disrupted at the moment, but um, thanks, Marga. Over to you. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Is this okay? My mic was failing and my voice was also failing, so <clears throat> I will try to <clears throat> to get it right. Okay, so um, I'm so glad to be with you today. It's, it's really a pleasure to be in a panel with so many friends and colleagues. It's really one of my favorite groups of people. Um, you have made my job very easy because you've said pretty much half of what I was going to say. Um, and so I will take the liberty to maybe say a few things about each of you um, and also share my story, which um, it's, I think, better than starting with the definition. So Ale, you will forgive me for not following the rules. <laughs> not the first um, time, Margaret. <laughs> not the first time. So I won't say certain things about you. Don't worry. Um, my, my training is in biology, so I'm a, I have a PhD in molecular biologist, which I conducted in Australia, but I was not the type of biologist or scientist that I should have been to have fun in it, as uh, Alithia or Melania did, or JC, looking at you know, the sky or oceans or uh, doing field work. So I was spending my time in a microscope, in a dark room, um, alone, and I realized that that was not the impact that I wanted my science to have. So after my PhD, after I had this crisis of what's next, do I want to go the academic route or not? Many of you in the audience I know had the same uh, kind of dilemmas and the same struggles uh, with your PhDs. So I decided to try something very 
crazy at the time, something that nobody was doing. Uh, and that, that was about eight years ago. I went straight from my PhD to an internship at the UN. So at the UN um, headquarters in New York, I was part of this cohort of fellows, 300 people, uh, most of them grad students, most of them in the traditional diplomatic fields, uh, international relations, political science, international law, um, human rights, and so forth. I was the only scientist and I was the only person with a PhD in that group of 300 people. So I realized something was very wrong because I was in the UN. It was the, the year of transition between the Millennium Development Goals, the MDGs, and the design and the plans for the sustainable, sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs and the 2030 Agenda. And I was surrounded by lawyers and political scientists. Nothing wrong with that, but the UN, as you know, works on things like climate change or uh, poverty eradication or um, uh, global health. And I found no other profiles like me in that environment. So I decided to, like Melania said, to take a path that would open spaces for others like me to also be part of. And that's very important because I was a woman, I was not a native English speaker, I was uh, young, and those characteristics were not always present in certain decision tables and conversations. So I realized I wanted to take that path, but I realized I also lacked certain skills, as many of you have said. Uh, I was a scientist, a pure scientist, basic scientist, and I had no idea about these other fields that all my colleagues um, had the background in. So I went to Georgetown University, which has one of the best foreign service schools in the world, in Washington, D.C., and I did a another fellowship program um, for Latin America and, and, and Spanish young leaders, uh, and where I learned all about business and about international law and about political science, entrepreneurship, um, human rights communications, many of the different knowledge, competencies, competencies and skills that I didn't get during my scientific training. And this goes back to your comments. Many of you have said about going back to kind of a level that you know, you, you're not supposed to be in that range because you have a PhD and you're a doctor and you expect certain, you know, certain uh, prestige or certain salaries. And then you have to go back to being sometimes an unpaid intern. How do you deal with that, right? So with that in mind, I thought it doesn't have to be like that. We shouldn't all need to go back to school, to take masters, to do unpaid internships or fellowships, because we have to find ways for our science to translate and to work with all these other communities at the same level. So after Georgetown, I joined the AAAS, which is the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Many of you have mentioned that. And I had the privilege of, um, at the time it was an early uh, time for the center. So the center was the first institution that was built, uh, dedicated exclusively to the topic of science diplomacy. It was where the first definition was created, the first um, framework for science diplomacy, which we are not going to go over because it's academic and theory and I'll let banned it from, from the panel. Uh, but basically, it, this was the place where the conceptualization of science diplomacy started in 2010. So uh, when I joined, it was 2014, I joined like JC as a research fellow. It was kind of a postdoc fellowship to transition between uh, any field and science diplomacy. Um, and so since, so from 2014 to 2019, five years I spent there. I was privileged, as I was saying, to have identified certain needs and certain gaps and certain uh, goals for both the scientific and the diplomatic community that could work together. And I was also privileged to uh, write my own job description. This is something I have not shared publicly, but basically because I was the third, um, I was after my two bosses, Vaughn Turekian and Tom Wang, um, I was the, the person in charge of building out the programs of the center. So I decided that I wanted to work on three topics. The first was there was a program between um, the AAAS and the Cuban Academy of Sciences to bring scientists from Cuba and the US together. Now, this might sound as international collaboration as normal, but it wasn't because at that time, Cuba and the US did not have diplomatic relations for over 50 years. If you're familiar with the situation, there's an embargo of the US Congress over uh, Cuba, and that made it very difficult for the US and Cuban scientists to cooperate. 
what does it mean? So being so close, two countries sharing the same vulnerabilities and challenges in terms of tropical diseases, in terms of um, storms and hurricanes, sharing the same ocean, the same ecosystems, it was really hard for those two countries and the scientists in both countries to work together to address those challenges. So I um, built a cooperation program between the US and Cuba for a number of years, which is very successful. It was about bringing together scientists from both sides and um, creating the first fellowship program, exchange program to bring Cuban scientists to the US in a structured way. That went on very well until 2017 that Donald Trump came into office and uh, things started getting uh, a little bit, um, you know, south. So the second pillar of that work was education. So as I said, I, I had identified through my own experience the need for more spaces for interaction and education and training between scientists and diplomats. So we created a number of programs around the world to train scientists in diplomacy, diplomacy in science, all of it. And um, many of the, the, these uh, offerings have been mentioned uh, both in Washington DC, but also in Trieste in Italy, and also in collaboration with many organizations like INSA, where I've had the, the privilege to work with Ale in many of the international science advice uh, and, and especially science advice in legislators. Uh, so there are many different aspects to that, but I won't go into it. Um, and this is really, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing to be with you because I could see many of the moments you described that you've had, like your realizations. I was able to witness them and, and I was part of it. So I'm really proud to be part of your, your story. So, and the last pillar that I wanted to build was this idea uh, that Lorenzo mentioned of uh, taking scientists into these policy um, institutions and government offices. So in the US, there's a big tradition, a very long tradition of having fellowship programs that take PhD scientists into a government agency at the same level, not going back and doing an unpaid internship, but they're actually getting double pay as if they were postdocs and they place in these very prestigious programs. So the oldest one has over 45 years of yeah, I think 47 years, the AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowship, which many of you are familiar with, but also things like what Lorenzo did, Royal Society, Pairing Schemes, uh, shadow programs, ways to bring scientists and policymakers together to, to really understand each other's language and change the culture and break this, those silos. So one of my goals and my, my task was to interna internationalize that model. So try to work with different countries in building their own science policy training programs, their own fellowships, their own science diplomacy strategies, and um, so forth. So I will finish by saying I, will, uh, I also went to Antarctica. I was part of this homeward bound leadership program that uh, both uh, Alicia and Melania um, were part of. And I was I'm so grateful to you because you uh, supported me and encouraged me to, to go. And this, is, this was like the you know, culmination of my dream because science, so Antarctica and the Antarctic Treaty are basically the first and the, the most well-known and the most aspirational part of science diplomacy on the planet because basically it was about dedicating an entire continent for uh, science and peace. So that was kind of the, one of the, the highlights of, of my career. I, I mentioned Trump because not, 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 not all is good. So after you know, a number of years of the Trump administration eroding both science and diplomacy in the United States, uh, and at the same time, um, many of you have mentioned the, some of the European programs. I also became an advisor uh, to the former European Commissioner for Research uh, Science and Innovation, Carlos Moedas, because he wanted to build a science diplomacy strategy for Europe. And this is how the, project, the program is for D4C and, and many others uh, started. So the EU made a big push for science diplomacy. And I basically moved back home to Spain, where I am right now, in Mallorca. And um, I will say that the, this academic community of science diplomacy is now flourishing in, in the EU uh, very, very strongly. And I'm also working with Lorenzo in the S4D4C program. Finally, I will just say one of sneak peek, I'm working with uh, Mexico to create the first chair in science diplomacy, the first academic chair. And I will share more soon or maybe in a few months. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks a lot, Marga. And uh, I will just uh, thank everyone who is like engaging in the chat. It's great to see uh, such a level of interest. I know there's lots of questions. We'll try to address them. Not might not be possible to do them all, but please keep writing in the chat. And thanks to all the panelists who are also replying in the chat while uh, presenting. So this is great. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, now it's just.
her to give us her perspective on what is science diplomacy and how she got involved in it. Thanks, Jessica. Hi, thank you, Alessandra. Thank you so much um, to Laurie as well, and Maud, uh, and to you to, for inviting me. It's really a pleasure being in one of these panels. I can't believe that I'm actually being one of the panelists. Uh, to me, this is a very important uh, moment uh, because I was um, actually attending these types of events and courses and trainees, trainees not so long ago. So uh, to me, it's really a pleasure being here and sharing with you all my experiences with science diplomacy. Uh, as the rest of the panelists, I was a um, researcher, molecular biologist. I did enjoy the research. I did enjoy science. I really like science. Um, but there was a point uh, that I very much um, agree with Lorenzo, that I couldn't stand just seeing how the papers, um, the research papers, were not really going anywhere. I mean, it is obvious and it's important that we all publish so there is a global knowledge of uh, the fields. Uh, but to me, it was uh, like an end point. Um, I needed to expand my experience with science in different ways. So I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Um, I knew that I liked um, or I was very interested in international development. I was also interested in public health. I was interested in many, many things that were not actual research. That it was pretty difficult for me to really understand myself and what I wanted to do. So, but I knew that I liked those things. So I started to, as I was saying, attend, I was, uh, started to attend these types of events. Um, my first contact with science diplomacy was in this amazing, a course that is run at Rockefeller University uh, on science diplomacy. It is an amazing uh, course because you have the opportunity to see different paths and you can be exposed to science diplomacy in reality. Like what does it really mean to do science diplomacy? And as you all are saying, for me, it may mean a different thing that means to you. And so you have the opportunity to actually see real projects, real, um, real um, programs that he, where you can identify yourself in. So to me, that was the first time from all the different uh, panelists that I had the opportunity to meet and to see. I was really impressed by the International the, um, uh, Scholar Rescue Fund at the Institute of International Education. Um, they didn't even know that they were doing science diplomacy and they didn't understand why they were invited to that panel uh, because this is what happens and you guys have uh, talked about this before. A lot of people, a lot of organizations, they don't know that they are doing science diplomacy. Um, but it is so nice to actually be involved uh, with one of these types of projects and then realize that you are doing science diplomacy and it's cool. You don't need to be a diplomat to do science diplomacy, right? So I started volunteering with a scholar rescue fund. I um, had the amazing opportunity to become friends with the director of the scholar rescue fund, Sarah Wilkos, uh, former director, she's an amazing person. And she introduced me to so many people in the field. And I remember four years ago, when I was attending these events and everybody was talking about networking. And to me, just hearing the word networking, I, I couldn't. It was like, I can believe this person is again talking about networking. It was such a difficult thing for me. By the way, sorry, I didn't tell, but um, I'm originally from Spain. Uh, I'm sure you can tell because of my accent but it is the truth it was the truth for me there is no way i would have ended up working where i'm working now if it wasn't for the networking and it, i don't mean that um i'm i was offered the position because i knew someone because it wasn't the case but it was um by meeting people that i started to be part of a small network 
that ended up being in a, a huge network. And then you have the opportunity to know about the organizations and knowing about projects. Otherwise, it's so difficult. You don't even know uh, what to start with. You don't even know what organizations are out there. So I was for a long time uh, looking for positions in uh, Washington because I had that, this idea that in Washington there were a lot of science diplomacy organizations, and it's true, there are a lot. And, but there is also uh, a, an amazing network of organizations here in New York and in Europe and in many, many different places. So it's really um, gay, getting yourself out there and uh, start doing these types of events, uh, getting to know people and organizations and projects that you are interested in. So I think I kind of answer what is science diplomacy to me. If I didn't, uh, I would say that to me, Science diplomacy is uh, putting countries, but not only countries, also different communities together in order to implement programs um, that um, will help to reach global development, and especially through sustainability. And uh, these have to be done with science-based solutions. That is my idea. That is why I'm so interested in science diplomacy. I don't understand a global development without science. I don't understand sustainable development without science. And I don't understand governments without scientists in the parliaments and the governments. It's just the vision that I have, it's just the way I think we should go. And I think we are all here fighting for that. Um, so yeah, so after just uh, going back to my, uh, uh, um, history with uh, science diplomacy. Um, through this network, uh, I had the opportunity to apply for an internship at UNESCO as science diplomacy intern. So I was doing a part-time internship while I was still in the lab here in New York in a science diplomacy department that was in, at UNESCO, but that is, is not, unfortunately is not anymore. Uh, so I had the opportunity to um, be exposed to the high level political forums at the UN and the General Assembly. And we were running many projects to specifically try to preserve the scientific heritage of countries at war. So it was super, super interesting, but I realized that I wanted to be closer to the field and to actually run projects, um, not so much institutional, um, if that makes sense. So last summer, I decided to quit our research and uh, really put in all my efforts to transition my career because uh, to me, doing the internship at UNESCO was really a tipping point. And I realized that I wasn't going to go back to the lab. I, I didn't want to do that anymore. Um, so I quit research. I uh, traveled to Uganda for some months uh, where we were working on global health and implementing programs, programs in local communities. It was such an amazing experience, but at the same time I realized I didn't want to move to uh, um, other countries to implement these programs as, um, my, as my life. So it's really a learning process to me. It's really still understanding where I fit the most. I'm now really enjoying very, very much uh, my work at the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Um, it's an organization convened by the United Nations in 2012 to implement the um, Sustainable Development Goals and reach sustainable development. And I'm working as an analyst in the Science Panel for the Amazon, where I work with more than 100 scientists, not only from the Amazon region, but also from Europe and United States to facilitate the writing of a report uh, to um, provide uh, with solutions to policymakers and to other stakeholders um, to improve the situation of the ecosystems and the economy of the Amazon basin countries. It's an amazing project. It's gonna be a very similar report to the IPCC, but I'll focus on the, on the Amazon. I am really enjoying it. It's, this is, 
I now see it clear, this is the things that I want to do. I want to work in, in projects where I still have the, um, um, the ability to work with many countries and really implementing policy measures and giving policy advice. Um, so I think that would be all. I'm sorry if I talk too much. Mm, absolutely. Well, thanks a lot, Jessica, and thanks again to everyone, uh, everyone on the panel, but also everyone in the audience, because uh, it's a great level of engagement. I see I'm struggling to keep pace with the chat, but it's great to see so much interest, and it's great to see that people are exchanging ideas and recommendations and advice. And I think one thing that emerged very clearly from the discussion so far is the importance of networks and networking and and reaching out to people, asking for advice and, and offering advice. So I think that we're seeing it now. Uh, I would say, you know, like, don't be shy. Uh, engage uh, with all of us uh, panelists. Uh, through, uh, uh, many of us are on Twitter, uh, you know, especially if you want to ask something, but you don't get a chance to ask now, now or you don't get that you were, reach out on Twitter, reach out on LinkedIn. Uh, these conversations, you know, are, are live and then they keep going. Um, and I guess the other point that I think emerged uh, very clearly from the discussion so far is that science diplomacy is not really a career path in a, in a well-defined way. And most of you uh, juggling several different roles and positions. I mean, a few like Lorenzo are lucky to have science diplomacy in the job title in a way, uh, while uh, many others are doing many things which are in the space of science diplomacy, but they, you have to be entrepreneurial. Uh, I think that's one thing that the stories of all the people on the panel really show is that you need to craft your own path. Uh, it's not like uh, I want to become, I don't know, like a, a banker where you like, you do your degree, then you enter like a graduate scheme, you do a couple of years and then it's clear, you know, like you take certain certifications and so on. Science diplomacy, it's, it's this amorphous object that each of us shapes in different ways which also I think speaks to the discussion of trainings and, and, and certifications and degrees. Those things are useful, but they are not really an end in themselves, I would say from my perspective. Like, it's not that you get a certificate in science diplomacy and then tomorrow there will be jobs in science diplomacy waiting for you. Uh, it, it's a great way to learn some of the skills that you need in order to do science diplomacy, uh, and, but you can learn those skills in many different ways. Uh, so speaking of skills, um, I'm conscious of time, but I think, I think this is, fits in very well with what has been discussed so far. Can each of you tell me very briefly, two minutes each, no more, what, what do you do when you do science diplomacy and what's the like one key skill that you really need to have in order to be successful in science diplomacy? Uh, we can start with the same running order, so maybe Alicia, you can start. So I, I, I always say that my superpower is to connect things that people don't see the connection. And, and I think that this is very useful in science diplomacy because you maybe you read a paper, a scientific paper, and you also know a gap in, 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 like in, in policy, but international level. And you also know some people that is an NGO that is doing like something related to that, but they lack the, 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 scientific expertise. So I think that um, you, you need to be able to connect all of these in a way that makes sense. And, and I think that that's very, very useful. And uh, the other thing that I think that is um, very useful is to be able to leave your comfort zone and feel comfortable being uncomfortable. And I think that I learned that from my PhD very much to feel comfortable being uncomfortable. And that's a skill that usually people doing research actively and thinking that they want to transition outside academia. But like, I like the skills. I think that like, I disagree completely. You have a lot of the soft skills that you need to transition to science diplomacy. And you're getting this like amazing training on feeling comfortable being uncomfortable. Hey, thanks. Uh, Melania, what about you? Yes, thank you. Well, I think uh, many people already on the chat posted the skill that I was going to mention, which is communication. Um, and for me, it was really fascinating. I grew up as the daughter of a kindergarten teacher, my mom. 
So since I can remember, she's been bringing me to her class and having me give talks on the solar system to cells or whatever, just because I was a scientist. So I started developing communication skills really early and really enjoying outreach. And I think that's part of what drove me out of academia, that I was dedicating so much to volunteering and outreach and communicating uh, that wasn't really part of the intent incentives of academia, um, that I was falling short compared to people that were not doing this. So I think we also have to have a, a, a conversation about how the incentives are really driving scientists who want to do this kind of interface out of the regular traditional uh, form of, of doing science. Uh, but yes, I would say communication is the biggest part. And it's not the same, of course, to talk to a school than to talk to negotiators. Uh, but if you have that ability of simplifying the science and, and dealing with the uncertainty that we're so comfortable with uh, and maneuvering that into something that can actually lead to action uh, for the policymakers, then I think that is one of the biggest strengths that you can have. Great. Thanks. Uh, JC, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Alessandro. Um, I might want to answer a slightly different question because there's so many, you know, skills that you can list. I mean, so I just want to pick up on the fact that uh, rightfully you said, you know, there are no clear educational pathways. Actually, the field is being defined um, as we speak and the way to, to teach knowledge and skills are currently um, in the process or being Defined so, um, and, and on that note, I just want to say that uh, Marga put in the chat that uh, she and I are working on a paper highlighting uh, knowledge and skills for uh, science diplomacy and sort of hinting at what would be those uh, in a science diplomacy curriculum. I just wanted to say again, there is no clear educational pathways, we've been trying to push them for quite a long time here, and this is why you see a lot of us having you know. <laughs> PhDs and then going back to masters or having you know double masters or this kind of complicated setup where we believe that there is a clearer path uh, towards it and we're pushing for it and getting the younger generation uh, quicker and you know faster into uh, into science diplomacy and the nexus where it's most most needed as a lot of the panelists have highlighted given all the global challenges that we are facing. Um, that said. It is a very tricky question to answer, so I'm going to default on that, and I'll let maybe uh, Marga and others uh, say a bit more about skills. But I just want to say, in terms of careers, I mean, they're, they're so, so diverse that it's very difficult actually to nail, you know, all the skills. Like, I just want to say, we've heard, you know, someone as a science attaché working in an embassy, like uh, Lorenzo. Uh, you can have be a science advisor and minister of foreign affairs. You can be an employee of a science foundation, a nonprofit working on international scientific issues can be an employee of a UN special agency looking at science, a member of an international scientific organization um, as an external relations officer. You can be a diplomat, you know, involved in SNT issues. So there's all kinds of knowledge and skills at the nexus, which it, it gives it, you know, it's very difficult to really highlight the few skills that you would need. But anyway, just, just wanted to uh, give a different tack to the discussion here and uh, let uh, others, uh, you know, uh, comment on the skills. Thanks, JC. You know, I think it's, it's, it's a very important point that you made and I think uh, reflects very well a lot of the points that have been raised. Uh, okay, uh, Lorenzo. Okay, uh, <clears throat> I'll talk a little bit about skills, but also knowledge required to work in this science diplomacy or science policy interface. Skills. Uh, you've already mentioned communication skills and that's mandatory to be working in this field. Second is entrepreneurship, creativity, and the ability to multitask, and uh, because you'll be able to develop quite a lot of projects at once. It's also important to have good people and networking skills. Alicia has already mentioned, is to have an idea of how to connect something that you have read with someone that you know, uh, or you have met in a conference like uh, two years ago. And uh, also, in science diplomacy, it's very important to be adept at institutional relationships. You are going to engage with uh, government officials and with uh, strict protocols. The better you know how government and other organizations work, the, the better you will be able to feed science and scientific experts in that process. 
Then, in order uh, to talk about knowledge required, uh, if you are a scientist, then I encourage you to get some training in policy as well as uh, uh, diplomacy or international affairs. And m most of us have had that path. Uh, but if you are a diplomat, then you would need some training in science. This training, it can be done by either taking a master, uh, master in international relationships or in policy analysis as, as some of us have done or you may attend workshops and courses on science diplomacy that are being organized all throughout the year uh, or for instance you may wait uh, uh, for a few weeks uh, like two or three weeks or as for the c we'll be launching an online course on european science diplomacy that will get you familiarized with the concept different national approaches and how the EU uh, uses science diplomacy in their uh, global approach. With that said, uh, I will give over uh, the floor to Marga, but I will introduce uh, one thing that is required for you to understand, and it's policy is not the same as diplomacy. But I will let Marga explain that. And I think we could do a whole other seminar on, on this topic. Uh, I think, uh, especially the point you made, Lorenzo, which I think is very important, that if you want to work in science diplomacy in the institutional sense of science diplomacy, then you need, really need to understand institutions, why they exist. You know, it can feel like it's frustrating, but there's a reason why things are the way they are. It might not be the ideal way, but you need to understand it. Uh, and I think it, that's why having an understanding of uh, international policy law as well can be very important if you decide to uh, get a career in science diplomacy. Of course, just to pick up before uh, I pass on the mic to Marga on some of the discussion in the chat, uh, many people are asking, you know, how to engage in science diplomacy without giving up a career in academia. And of course, you can engage in science diplomacy remaining a scientist in a way or an active researcher. This will probably be very different. And some of the skills are the same. I think the networking skills are equally important. Uh, I, I, would say that probably if you go down a more professional pathway in science diplomacy, then that institutional understanding of the legal frameworks or institutional frameworks is especially important. Uh, but again, uh, it's not about getting the certification, it's about understanding the system. Anyway, Marga. Thank you, Lorenzo, you set me up. Um, I will say that we're talking about mostly the, the path from science to diplomacy here, because all of the skills that we're mentioning are skills that the diplomats have and they come, um, how do you say, in, from factory. <laughs> and you don't have to treat both groups equally. You will need to give some of these skills to the scientists and some of the skills to the diplomats and complement. So that's very important and that's what already JC announced in this paper where we have coming up to try to formalize a little bit what a curriculum looks like, not just a curriculum of knowledge. So if you're a scientist, you need to understand international politics and geopolitics and international law and all of the things you are not taught in the scientific traditional scientific education and then vice versa if you're a diplomat you have a very generalist career and, and background so perhaps you might not be so familiar with very technical you know science engineering innovation issues so basically a curriculum or a skills path needs to take into consideration what different skills both communities need and then bring them together to train together. And that's, I think, the most important part and the most crucial part. So when a scientist steps into a multilateral negotiation, for instance, as um, Lorenzo, I think, was, was mentioning, it is less important what you know than how do you say it, when, and whether you know how to respect protocol. You know that there's an order, there's like a hierarchy, you can't just speak whenever you want, you have to dress in a particular way. All of these skills are soft and maybe not even skills. It's just the knowledge of the other culture. So no matter how good you are and how much you know, and we see this in climate change and we see this in COVID-19, we see this all the time. Scientists that do not communicate, not just the knowledge in the, in the um, easy or understandable way, but also the way they understand the context in which they operate is extremely important. The best way to teach this we've found is through experiential learning, uh, negotiation simulations like model UN types of things where the scientists step into a 
diplomat role or the diplomat step into science and they realize how difficult it is. For scientists, for instance, they have to sometimes defend things that are against their values and their beliefs. Uh, and the diplomat has to follow the line um, dictated by the capital and negotiate on those uh, red lines and those terms. So this is, uh, um, you know, it's extremely important to, to have immersion experiences. Otherwise, theory and being, you know, told or, or you know, teaching in a class doesn't really let you grasp it. So that's um, fundamental. And then in the, the second shameless plug that we make with the S44C, uh, this course that Lorenzo announced is, is the um, online course. It has a number of modules. One of them is about skills. And it, this was the one I, I focused on. It was extremely difficult to develop, but we kind of came up with a framework for skills training. So we will be reaching, um, getting this to you. And then the last thing is what Ale asked me to share the best kept secret in science diplomacy jobs. <laughs> <laughs> How do you say about the 10 things you'll never guess? Or yeah, like you will, you will never believe this thing. <laughs> <Science diplomacy. laughs> so it's the clickbait. Exactly. So most science diplomacy jobs don't have the word science or diplomacy in them. So if we go and look for those jobs, of course they don't exist, right? So many of us, some of us, have had the you know privilege of having that in our job title. But increasingly, there's need for disciplinary science diplomacy, meaning climate diplomacy and ocean diplomacy and health diplomacy, global health diplomacy, please. So those are the building blocks of science diplomacy. So you don't have to only look for that word. And the same with the diplomacy word, right? There's words like governance. Like there's many different, um, you know, dimensions to it that might not, um, you know, have include the words. So don't be discouraged by, you know, Googling other oh, no science diplomacy jobs. It's, it's unfortunate because that means you have to do a lot more on your part kind of being entrepreneurial and, 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 and thinking out of the box, like many of you have said. But just to you know, dispel some of the myth, because it is really some, some of the you know, trainees and people who go through the trainings get frustrated because there's no career path. But actually, there are job opportunities. You just have to match your expertise and your skills to what's needed in, in the world. So no, I'm not saying easy, but. Thanks, Margaret. Jessica, your thoughts on this? Um, thank you, Rosanna. I was thinking that um, there are many, many skills needed. Some of them, we gain them um, as scientists because we are, I think, we learn to know how to be resilient and many other things that we don't even realize and then they are very much needed outside research. Um, many, many skills, for example, just stupid skills like being able to work during a meeting because you're not going to have more than one hour to work on your project outside meetings because your calendar is completely full of meetings. That is a stupid thing that to me, it was overwhelming. Like, wow, this is crazy. But all these skills that I was thinking, I mean, you will really learn uh, those, those skills once you get exposed to these types of jobs. And they are not, uh, they don't refer only to science diplomacy, they refer to working outside research. Um, but I think uh, that um, probably a skill that you need to get uh, to work on science diplomacy, to me is never underestimate a person. Never think that someone um, it doesn't, seem that is working on an interesting project. Uh, such, import, such an important thing to have an open mind and being able to read people and understand what they are doing, what, what their passion is, and if you can help them, and then they will help you as well and create this an amazing network of people interested in science diplomacy, but they are, not, as I was saying before, they are not calling it science diplomacy. That is probably, I would say, the best skill you can have to really end up working on science diplomacy. Uh, because it's a skill that it will get you there, but also once you're working on science diplomacy, it will help you to identify stakeholders and people that work in the fields, but also work in the, in the government. So never underestimate someone's role on a project and uh, 
in science diplomacy in general. Thanks, Jessica. Well, thanks again to everyone. Um, so uh, I think that given that we only have about 10 minutes left, and I know there's lots of questions that have been asked in the chat, and some of them have been answered. Unfortunately, we can't uh, address them all. Uh, but I just wanted to draw your attention on the results of the poll that we conducted among our audience. Uh, I think it's quite interesting. Of course, like as expected, given that this is uh, organized uh, from uh, New York City, with a large share of audience from North America, large share from Europe, but there is like, you know, good numbers from like Latin America, Asia, someone from Africa. Actually, someone was asking specifically if there is uh, science diplomacy opportunities uh, in the African continent. So maybe if, if any of you has uh, uh, knowledge of this and wanna say something, I, I think this would be uh, very interesting to broaden up a little bit perspective. Also, the other thing I noticed from the survey is that uh, we got a good split, about like 30% uh, students, so like grad students, undergrad students, 35% postdocs, but we got a good 20% of people who identify themselves as not scientists. And this here in this panel on science diplomacy, which I think it's, it's fascinating, but also it's testament to the breadth of the, the field and the, the, the breadth of experiences that can um, contribute uh, to, to this field. Um, so, in the uh, interest of time, so first, does any of you have uh, any knowledge of opportunities outside, uh, sort of like Europe and North America, which is what we most have focused on so far? Uh, feel free to speak if you if you are, or maybe raise your hand. Alessandro, I posted Please. it already, but okay. I, I I did share that the fellowship uh, at the UN that I did is specifically for developing countries. So if you are not from uh, Europe or, or the US, then do um, you know, reach out that there are um, you know, opportunities that are specific for those kind of audiences that uh, definitely have to be represented because uh, we need to hear more of those voices of Latin America and Africa and other places. Mm -hmm. Also, just adding to that, the INCSA network, the International Network for Government Science Advice, I'll post a link, uh, they have regional chapters. So they have a chapter for uh, Latin America, they have a chapter for Africa. They don't necessarily have like job opportunities, but they're great networking uh, groups. So uh, I would recommend uh, looking into those uh, networks. Uh, does anyone else from the panel want to say something about uh, opportunities? Yes, uh, please, uh, Jessica. Um I would like to say people to check um, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network uh, because it's an amazing network of uh, institutions, organizations, universities all over the world. And you can uh, learn about the projects that we run at the organization and you can join by volunteering or you can check for the opportunities. And it's an amazing network to check. Thank you. Margaret? I want to say something else, oh. Alessandro, yes, if please. I may. So like, I, I see a lot of people in the chat talking about like how, how to create opportunities for like science diplomats and how to bring uh, science diplomacy to like the spotlight, basically. I wanna say that, and please don't, don't take me wrong, but like this crisis, this sanitary crisis that we are, that we are living right now, uh, highlighted around the world the importance of science and science advisors and science diplomacy, uh, governments talking to other governments. And I think that, or I don't know if it is my hope or, or, I, or, or if it is going to happen, but I do think that the world is realizing about how important science diplomats are, are, are in our society and for our future with all of these global challenges like COVID-19, but also climate change. And I, I, think that, I think that now is the moment to capitalize the, this um, interest that the, the society is having in, in, in science and to find a way to sell your skills uh, into not only government, but also organizations and NGOs and, and all of these um, actors that we've been talking for an hour and a half that are part of the science diplomacy sphere. Thanks, Alicia. I think JC wanted to say something. Yeah, no, just just uh, a few words. I mean, uh, uh, again, a lot of the pathways are quite hidden, right, in the field. I'm not even talking about educational pathways. I'm talking about the way to get into the field. So the all, a lot of the fellowships 
are, are sort of obscure. You really have to dig, you know, to, to find them and, and find those pathways. And you've heard Melania, for example, you've heard others go through those fellowships. So really you have to, to dig for, to, to find them, but there are other opportunities to engage, right? Um, uh, the, you, you could look for the science, science policy clubs, science diplomacy clubs, you can engage, you can even engage on Twitter. A lot of us have actually met on Twitter and engaged on Twitter and then became colleagues and friends, right? In the field. So that's another thing that you, you, uh, you should do. Uh, there are other ways to engage uh, in science diplomacy, or, um, like uh, if you're uh, under 30, for example, the UN major group of children and youth and their science policy interface works with the UN system directly and there's no barrier of entry bes besides the age, uh, the below 30. Uh, you can also, um, you know, if you're a young uh, science policy or diplomacy enthusiast, you can publish in the Journal of Science Policy and Diplomacy. Uh, and uh, sorry, uh, Journal of Science Policy and Governance, right? Which also publishes uh, things around science uh, diplomacy. It, it, there's no barrier to entry to uh, register to INCSID, the International Network for Government Science Advice, which has a science diplomacy division. Uh, there's all kinds of ways to engage, right? Which are shrouded at first, but if you talk and networking ski here, you can talk, reach out to us, we'll give you some of those uh, ways to, to, to uh, find those pathways. So don't hesitate. Thanks, Margaret. Yes, to complement that, there are many of um, the alumni and, and people who came together through different trainings and meetings and, and events that then went back to their countries and their institutions and created the opportunities for themselves after having engaged with others. So I think there is now a diffusion effect uh, quite important. So many countries and many of the colleagues in the audience are, are part of that uh, effort. Um, specifically about uh, Global South and, and especially Latin America, there's a lot of activity, not just at the government level. So some countries are creating, for instance, the traditional positions in science diplomacy that could be science advisors to foreign ministries or science attaches or, or different scientific figures at embassies. But this is really just a very narrow path. There are universities creating courses and, and postgraduate seminars and even sub-national and city science diplomacy efforts. So it's very important now that the world, we see that there was a retreat from multilateralism, hopefully it will not be after COVID-19, but we don't know. Uh, but we, we would see more and more efforts at the local and, and state level. So for instance, when the, U, the US pulled out of the Paris Agreement, the governors and the mayors stepped up to, to kind of, you know, find a way to meet and, and, and to meet the targets and, and, and the commitment for, for climate um, ambitions. So the same has happened, for instance, in, in Brazil, Sao Paulo. There's a fantastic summer school in August. I, I, I'm, I haven't posted because I haven't found the link yet, but I will. So it's a sub-national science diplomacy level. It allows you to really see more of the local ecosystems of science diplomacy. Panama is a country that was the first one in, in the region to develop a science diplomacy strategy. And as I said, Mexico is one of the, at the city and, and, and state level also doing a lot. So um, feel free to reach out to me if you want to know who's doing what in which country. Uh, probably I will know somebody that knows. So let's, let's find a way to keep this group connected and this 150 something people, because I think there's a lot of uh, knowledge and collective Great. resource here. Well, thanks a lot, Marga. Uh, I'm conscious of time, we're reaching the end of it, uh, but uh, maybe uh, if any of you want to say like a final word, I mean, especially like uh, uh, Lorenzo and Alicia, who I think have not spoken in this last round, but you know, anyone who feels like we'll say a last word very briefly, and then we can conclude. Um, if I may, like, Please. I'm going to start. Um, like every time that I, that I participate in one of these um, career panels and I talk about my experience and, and what I did or what, I, what I'm planning on doing, I like to finish always with um, um, a phrase. And I always uh, like mention this phrase from Dory of like <laughs> Finding Nemo that is like, just keep swimming because like, um, it is, everybody has mentioned in this panel that there's no path, that there's, uh, you have to create your own path. You have to look for your own opportunities and, and you have to be very resilient because like you are completely lost a lot of times. That's why when I, when I speak at the very beginning, I mentioned that I'm still transitioning towards the, the place where I want to go uh, despite having already a career in science diplomacy. And that's why like I, I say to myself constantly, just keep swimming because like this is, this is what you need to do. You need to 
keep looking for opportunities, keep networking, and, and keep looking for role models and talking to people and exploring their CVs and what they did and, or what they did and didn't work, which is also important to know someone else's mistakes. So I see a lot of people interested here in, in starting their own path. Just be aware that it's going to be a unique path because there's no universal science diplomacy path yet until we don't have like um also that some some of us have also mentioning which is like capacity for real thank you Lisa. lorenzo like a final word okay uh yes um i wouldn't like this uh, panel just to uh or, or all the attendees to go home uh thinking that we are asking them to leave academia if they are working in academia I see science diplomacy, uh, I mean, you may have two pathways. One is you stay doing research, but with a different mindset, that your research needs to have some kind of impact at the policy or diplomacy level. And to do that, you engage in a specific meetings at different international conferences or at different policy gatherings to provide your scientific expertise and make science has an, uh, have an impact in policy and diplomacy. But if academia is not for you, you, don't, uh, you feel like you are called somewhere else, then get out of your comfort zone and start getting yourself trained with masters, programs, uh, schemes, workshops, whatever, to acquire skills and knowledge, but more importantly, to networking with people who are working in the field and who may give you proper advice as to who you need to meet or where you need to start doing a specific program. And to do that, scientific associations like INET New York or ECUSA or SRUK or many others that we have been mentioning in the panel and also in the chat are a perfect platform for you to develop those skills and to, for you to get exposed to the policy and to the diplomacy landscape. Uh, with that said, I think that's more or less uh, everything from my side. Thank you, Lorenzo. So uh, I would say uh, we wrap up here. Uh, it's been an, a, an amazing conversation. I know that there is a lot more that we will cover uh, in this uh, 90 minutes we had, and each of our panelists has a wealth of experience. So again, I encourage uh, you all to reach out to them, uh, reach out to each other. We'll uh, make the recording available. We'll also try to make the content of the chat available, given there is a lot uh, of um, resources that have been shared. Just two specific things before I close. One is an internship opportunity, which I saw recently just occurred to me. It's a great science policy uh, opportunity at the European Southern Observatory, uh, which is a multilateral uh, scientific collaboration. Uh, it's basically like a very large telescope, uh, but it's also a great science diplomacy project, and they're looking for a science policy intern. I posted the link in the chat. Uh, and the other one, of course, I mean, I, I, will, uh, I could not not say that, uh, of course, UCL is a great place to learn about science policy and science diplomacy. Uh, the uh, Department for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Public Policy, where JEC is based and that I collaborate with, has courses in this. Uh, but generally, like London, I think historically has been a great science diplomacy uh, city uh, and has lots of organizations. And uh, many of us cross the path there. So, uh, definitely something to uh, keep in mind. And with this, uh, I think uh, the time has come to close. Uh, I would like uh, first to thank uh, INET for organizing this, uh, and especially uh, Lori, who has been, uh, I think, uh, instrumental in making this happening uh, and making sure that you know everything ran smoothly. So a big thank you uh, to Lori. Uh, a big thank you uh, for uh, to all the audience. Oh yeah, we should do a clapping, a virtual clapping to Lori for her efforts. Uh, and also a big thank you for the audience because I know that uh, it's, a, it's a lot of time to take off, an hour and a half or lunch or evening, depending which time zone you're in. Uh, but I hope that uh, you felt value out of it and uh, I'm really grateful that you uh, engage and give advice to each other. Uh, and of course, uh, a great thank you uh, to the panelists for taking the time, sharing their experience and for the availability, which I know does not end here, but is actually their door is, is open uh, for uh, any approach. So thank you everyone and uh, please let's uh, continue this conversation uh, through many other channels. Thanks.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Good you. to see everybody. Thanks, everybody.